page which has got the heading Head and Shoulders Government. I want to just explain this and then we're going to give the rest of the time tonight then to, to questions. There's, there's quite a few pages here but I'm not going to go through them all. Quite a bit of it I think is self-explanatory but I do want to, to deal with this. And let's just begin in Isaiah chapter 9 please. Isaiah chapter 9. Without going into it in any great detail, you'll find that at the end of chapter 8, you have the whole earth filled with darkness, people hard-pressed, hungry, enraged, cursing their government and their God, and looking upwards. This is quite a picture of today, isn't it? Eh? And further back, you find that they're seeking mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, and they're not seeking their God and they're looking on the earth and they see trouble and darkness and gloom in anguish and they are being driven into darkness. What a picture that is of today. Amen? And then in chapter 9 we get the response. The, 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 the translation, one is, but there will be no more gloom. And God is promising that light's going to come to this darkness Amen. in a glorious and magnificent way. And in verse 3 there is the, the promise of harvest the people who walk in darkness, they are going to see a great light. And those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. And in verse 3, you're going to multiply the nation, you're going to introduce their joy, you're going to rejoice before God according to the joy of harvest. And I have experienced the joy of harvest. When I was uh, ministering in Bombay in the years 1972 through 76, we had already... Um, seeing God turn our rather dull dead Baptist church into a living church full of the Holy Ghost. We had packed meetings and we were seeing exciting things. But how many of you know that God's not happy to have a living church in a demonized city? That's not good enough for God. And so the next phase came in the year 72-76 when God broke in upon the Catholic community in which we were now planting out new churches. I haven't time to tell the whole story, it would take far too long, but just, just to say that over a period of four years, that dark, demonic, desperately needy part of the city, I can't describe to you how black and iniquitous and dark and demonic it all was, but God just broke in on that community. And over a period of four years, without any exaggeration at all, we saw over 100,000 people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. It was absolutely wonderful. And now there are dozens of churches. In fact, there are hundreds of churches across the city of Bombay. When I first went there, there wasn't even one in the whole city. Now we're, we're, we've gone past the 2,000 mark as far as new churches across the city of Bombay. And it's gone all over the nation and it's increasing all the time. So, and in those days, it, it was so incredible that you didn't even have time to eat my wife would go out shopping and she wouldn't come back for hours. I said, what happened? She said, well, I got pulled into that house. I led them all to the Lord. I went into that house and this person was sick and I prayed and God raised them up. I went to that house and there was this demon-possessed boy and I cast all the demons out. She said, I just couldn't get home. And, 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 and it went like on like that for four years. We literally had families coming and knocking at our door and literally saying, what can we do to be saved? And we wouldn't have to go looking for them. They came looking for us. It, when God moves in the power of, of, of his own mighty spirit, I tell you, you know you taste the joy of harvest. And I can, I can smell it coming to, to the northeast of the United States. I can smell it. I tell you, I am not mistaken. We're going to see such a breaking forth of God. I, we really are. But I want you to see some of the preparation for that. And so there's the promise of the joy of harvest. And then at the end of verse 4, there is certain methodology prescribed. It's going to happen as in the days of Midian. And if you look at your Bible, you'll find that that is telling us the story of Gideon. Judges chapter 6 and Judges chapter 7 tell us the story of Midian, of how at that time the people of God were trying to reap a harvest. Every time they went out to sow, the Midianites destroyed the harvest. They never reaped a harvest. Only Gideon managed to get a little bit of harvest, and he was reaping the harvest behind the wine press. You know, it's a picture of trying to keep those few people you got saved under the blood in case the devil snatches them back again. Because, you know, the power of the world is so strong that even if you get people saved, it's an almighty job to hang on to them. Would you agree with that? 
And we've had a lot of evangelistic activity, but we have not had much evangelistic success. Would you agree with that? If you've got 20 people saved in your church, you are worthy of front page news on Charisma magazine. That's the tragedy of America right now. It just isn't seeing any powerful, effective means of saving men and women, and yet the situation is absolutely desperate. It's very easy to become relatively successful because no one else is doing anything at all. So don't let's kid ourselves. Just because we've seen a few people saved, it's nothing like it ought to be. And in that context, the angel comes to Gideon, and in chapter 6 he prepares the man. How many of you know that God never moves without a man? There has to be a man. Amen? So, and then, round the man gathers a covenant community of committed people. 32,000 happy, clappy charismatics were no use to God. It was 300 committed people that God used. It was 318 that God used for Abraham to, to slaughter the four kings. You see, there's a principle here. It requires a father head, and then a committed community to that father head, that's the power that God uses to destroy all the work of the enemy and to reap a mighty harvest. Amen? Once Gideon went to battle against the Midianites and destroyed them according to the plan of God, then they went out into the same fields with the same seed and planted a harvest and reaped a mighty harvest, because the problem wasn't the seed, the problem was the Midianites. Hello. Amen. And why can't people in New York and New, New Jersey and, and Newark come to God? The answer is because the God of this world has blinded their minds. It's, it's a demonic blindness, and so it's a, it requires a spiritual breaking of that blindness before they can come. So it's not new methodology. It, it's, it's winning something. It's, it's defeating the Midianites. Is that okay? Amen. So, so that's, the, the, that's how God's going to turn this terrible darkness into glorious light and reach a fantastic harvest. And it's in this setting you come straight down to verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. So, you see, it's not only necessary to be able to reap a harvest, you've also got to establish government. If you don't, you will lose what you've reaped. Hello? And so, government is a very important issue with God. And, of course, we're talking here about the Lord Jesus. And the first thing that's said about the Lord Jesus is that he's going to be an establisher of government. Amen? It's the first thing that's said about him. And that the government's going to be upon his shoulders. And then it goes on to say, in verse 7, that of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. So the government of Jesus and the peace connected with it is destined to go on increasing. It will never regress, it will only increase. Isn't that fantastic? Amen? And then it goes on to say that there will be no end upon the throne of David over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice for that time forward, even forevermore. So it's clear that this scripture applies to today. Would you agree with that? And then it tells us that it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts who's going to accomplish this. So God is pretty zealous about this thing. Alright? So government's important with God. And so we need to understand what God's government is and see that it's established in order for this great harvest to be reaped because it was when Gideon and the people got themselves into governmental order that they saw the kingdom come. It was the same with, 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 with Abraham and of course it was the same with King David. Once they got the order in, then God poured his anointing upon the order. Is that okay? That's a very quick summary so you know where we're coming from. And this is not just a nice way of doing church. It is mandatory because God's got such terrific purposes through the church that the church has got to get itself in proper order in order that the power can come. Okay. So let's have a look at this. And so we, we, we read then that, that government and peace go together. And I, I say here, pray for its increase. And Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, he said, seek first of all, what? the kingdom, or if you like, the government of God and his righteousness. That's the thing you are to seek first of all, and all these other things will be yours as well. That's the first thing we have to seek according to Scripture. 
And then I just wanted, uh, you, you could draw a diagram here, and I want you to sort of draw on your sheet here just a large bar, just a square or rectangular bar, and then in the middle, under a crystal, just draw a picture of a crystal, and then under, under or above, I should say, the word molecule, just draw a picture of a molecule. Because I want to give you an illustration here. And what I, want to, what I want to show you is this, from, is that if you're going to look at pure copper, if you've got a big bar of pure copper and you subject it to certain chemical and physical tests, you can prove it's pure copper by the way it responds to these tests. Amen? So it's not what's on the label, it's the way it responds to these tests that you can tell it's pure copper. If you take a crystal out of that big bar and subject that crystal to the same chemical and physical tests, although the crystal is much smaller, it will respond in exactly the same way to the same chemical and physical tests. A crystal of pure copper behaves like a bar of pure copper. Is that okay? If it were possible to take one single molecule of pure copper and subject it to the same physical and chemical tests, it would still respond in the same way. Because it's pure copper, okay? So, so whatever level you take it, because of its purity, it behaves in a predictable way concerning certain physical and chemical properties. Now, the kingdom of God is just the same way. And there are certain things that run right through the kingdom of God, which identified as the kingdom. If these properties are there, it's the kingdom. And if these properties are not there, it is not the kingdom, whatever it might say on the label. Amen? Have you got that? And, and you see, once you get that principle, you're looking for these identifiable qualities anywhere in the kingdom of God. If you take the, the let's take, and, and I've listed a whole list of these things, which I'm not going to go through tonight, but here are some of the qualities that we have to look for. First of all, righteousness. Amen? That's the first thing you look for. And then there's love. And then the third thing I put down is government. Then I put headship fatherhood, and then I put a whole list of things which I haven't time to go into. Now, if those things are not there, it's not the kingdom. Amen? Whatever it's said to be, it isn't. If it doesn't, is it, would it pass the righteousness test? Would it pass the love test? Will it pass the government test? Would it, and is there a clear head to the thing? Is there real fatherhood? These are the things we're looking for because we're told in Scripture that these are the things that run right through from beginning to end. Now let's start with God himself. First of all, in the trinity of the Godhead, we have three persons. Amen? Are they righteous? Is there love there? All right, let's talk about the other things. Do we find government in the headship of the three persons of the Godhead? Who has the government of the three? And who submits to that? The Father, I mean the Son and the Spirit, would you agree? Is there headship? Yeah. Yes, God is the head. Does that mean that the Spirit and the Son are inferior? No, it's just that there is order in the Godhead. Amen? So we find in the Godhead, we find the essential elements of what we've come to call the kingdom. Right, let's go into the universal church. Does the universal church have fatherhood in it? Well, let's start at the beginning. Does it have righteousness in it? Who, see, Jesus, who is, who is he's, it's said of him that he loved righteousness and he hated iniquity and we're told that his throne is a throne of righteousness and I could go on and on and on. Right, let's ask them, is there, is there headship there? Who is the head over all things in the church? Jesus Christ. Who is the Father? Amen. Jesus, can you see that all those things are there? Now, if you go right through the order of the kingdom until you get down to a single molecule, the single molecule of the kingdom is the natural family, okay? That's the other end. There's no smaller unit. When I was taught chemistry all those years ago, I was taught that, that a molecule is the smallest part of a substance which can exist alone represent the substance and take part in a chemical reaction. Now, the smallest part of the kingdom which can exist alone and can model the kingdom is the natural family. Amen? So does it have headship? Does it have fatherhood? Does it have government? Can you see how it runs right through the whole thing? 
Now, in all those intermediary stages of the kingdom, if it's properly structured, we should find the same elements. Should a local church have headship? Absolutely. Should it have government? Absolutely. Should it have righteousness and love? And of course it must have. So if it hasn't got these things, it's not the kingdom. Have you, are, you, are you grasping the principle here? Because you see, in some of these places, we don't have a sort of a biblical model of every intermediate stage of the kingdom. Well, what about something? Well, is, let's see, is it in the order? You know, and so what you often have to do is you start with the great universal church or you start with God himself and you extrapolate down to the situation in which you find yourself. That's one way you can come to truth. Is that okay? Or conversely, you can say, well, what's it like in the natural family? And then we can extrapolate up to see how it ought to be at a larger subsection of the kingdom. So if there's fatherhood in the family, then what's it like? Well, it's going to be in the church, it's going to be like the family, only bigger. Have you got the picture? Now, in that, I found that extremely helpful in coming to clarity about many, many things in setting things in order in the church. Because all I have to do is to look at the Godhead, look at the universal church, look at the natural family, and then I can extrapolate from both ends to find out what I should find in the middle. If it's not there, it's not the pure kingdom. It's become adulterated in some way. Amen? Is that okay? So on that basis, I want us to just proceed with our thought here. And, and in the Godhead, as we've seen, you find... Fatherhood, you find fatherhood, you find God, you find uh, um, headship, and you find government. Now, when God made man and woman in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, this is what he said. He said, let us make man in our image, male and female made he them. And he goes from the singular to the plural, and, you've, and he said that they're going to be in our image. And so what God intended in the husband and wife partnership was that they should reflect the us-ness of the Godhead. So if it's going to be created by God to represent them, will it have headship? Evidently. Will it have fatherhood? Yes, it will. But it's plurality. It's them. Then he said, let them rule. Not let him rule, let them rule. You see, does Jesus have governmental authority? Of course he does. Does the Holy Spirit have governmental authority? Yes, he does. But does he have the headship of that? No, the Father does. Can you see you can have government without headship? You could, the government is wider than the head, but all true government from God has headship within the government. The government is plural, but the head is singular. Now that goes right through the order of God's kingdom. Is this making sense to you? And so in the family, the government of the family is not the man alone, it's the husband and wife together. They have the government of the family, but he has the headship of the government. She's part of the government. So the government is plural, but the headship is singular. Can you see that? So if we come back into the local church, what are we looking for? We're looking for plurality of government, but singularity of headship. And the headship leads the government, and yet it's sort of, in a way, it just is part of, and yet stands out from the government. See, the government's on his shoulders, but the head is upon the shoulders. And so, this is why I've called it head and shoulders government, because the government is the plurality of government, and the head is the head that sits on the shoulders to give that sort of clear executive headship to the government, which is more than one. Is that okay? So let's ask ourselves the question. Is that okay? Do you understand that? So let's, so let's just go on. And um, we notice in Scripture uh, that apostles and elders in Scripture are always, functionally, they're always mentioned in plurality. In Jerusalem, it wasn't the apostle, it was the apostles. Amen? Every time you find apostles in a church, it's in plurality. And the same is true of the elders. Amen? It's always in plurality. And yet, within that plurality, 
If it's to be the real kingdom, there has to be headship. So let's take the church of Jerusalem, the first church that was ever born. It was born of God on the day of Pentecost. It had plurality of apostles. It had plurality of elders in the one place. But did it have a head? Did it? And if so, who was it? And the answer is, it was clearly James. Although there were 12 apostles and Peter was among them, it wasn't Peter that was the head, it was James. That comes out very clearly from Scripture. It was James who brought the judgment in Acts 15. It was James to whom Peter sent the message. It was James that Paul went to to submit his gospel. you find all over the, the Acts of the Apostles that James stands out as the final head of the plurality of government which the Apostles and the elders together represent. So there was clear headship, although there was plurality. So I want to develop this. Now come to Psalm 133, please. Because the fact that we have plurality doesn't automatically assume equality. That's where we've got to avoid confusion. Look at Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now notice we've got two words here. We have the word good, which is a moral word, and we have the word pleasant, which is an experience word. Now, the reason that brethren dwell together in unity is because it is morally required of them. It also happens to be pleasant. Hello. How good it is for a husband and wife to dwell together in unity. Well, it's much pleasanter if you do, but it's also it's mandatory that you do. Because, you see, the opposite is also true. How evil and unpleasant it is when brethren do not dwell together in unity. It's not only unpleasant, it's also evil. Now, who inhabits goodness? God. Amen? Wherever you find goodness, you find God. That's what Jesus said. There's no, no one good but God. So God can only live in and that which is good. Would you agree with that? Who inhabits evil? Satan. So if you have evil in your home which means you're not dwelling together in unity, then Satan has a perfect right to live there. And he will give you merry hell. He will. All you've got to do is to not live together in, in unity and you've invited Satan to come in and mess up your family. You really have. It really is that serious. It's not only unpleasant, it's also evil. Hello. And the same is true of the church. If you have a bunch of leaders that are not dwelling together in unity, what does that mean? It means it's evil. Who occupies evil? The devil does. So if you don't live together in unity as leaders of a church, then you've invited the devil to come. And he will come and he will play merry hell with your church. The devil's always harassing this church. Well, the first thing to check out is your unity. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A city divided against itself cannot stand. A household divided against itself cannot stand. Oh, I do wish we would listen to the Word of God. Because the devil has a perfect right to occupy division. He's a perfect right. It says in Matthew 18, and I think it's verse 19, Jesus says there, if if two of you agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done for them. Now that word agree is the Greek word. The Greek word is the Greek word symphonio. We get our English word symphony comes from it. And it means to make the same sound together. It's like being two violins in the same orchestra. You tune them until they make a perfect sound. They are in absolute harmony. And when all the instruments of an orchestra are tuned to play like one instrument, we say that this is now symphony. And the, and the conductor can now conduct all these instruments and they all play together, they make the same sound together and there's perfect symphony. So when two are in perfect symphony, that's what he's really saying, they can ask the Father for anything and he will do it for them. Isn't that incredible? And, and in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, uh, there Peter says, he says, the husbands have got to live with your wives in an understanding way. That's not optional, it's obligatory. You've got to live with your wife in an understanding way, honouring her, honouring her, 
as joint heirs together of the grace of life. And he said, otherwise, he says, your prayers are going to be hindered. If you're not doing that, you're going to have your kids messed up by the devil, and it's probably the disunity of the parents which is responsible for that. If the parents are united, that our kids are going to serve God and not the, not the devil, there's no place for the devil to come in. See, it's really as serious. Where The devil's not playing games. And where he sees opportunity to legally come in, he'll come in. How good it is and how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then it goes on to say, in the next verse, it says, it's like the precious oil upon the head. It immediately goes to headship. Can you see that? You see, plurality does not mean equality. Plurality means unity with recognized godly headship. So there has to be headship in the unity for it to be the kingdom. There has to be headship in the plurality for it to be the kingdom. And the moment you've got headship, then there is somewhere for the anointing to come. Because the anointing has to come upon a head. So if you've got a bunch of deacons saying, well, we're all equal, and we're not going to have any heads around here, there's no place for the anointing. Because it has to come upon the head. If the wife says to the husband, well, look, I mean, I'm just as equal as you are, and you know, we get all this, this excessive feminism, please don't misunderstand me here, I do believe in women being equal in every way except to the point of headship. Everything else, they're caught, and, and you know there's been so terrible things done and said by men, but that doesn't mean that God wants to wipe out his order. The order is husband and wife of equal value, just like the Godhead. They're as equal as the Godhead is, but there still has to be father headship for the family to work properly. So if there's no headship, there's nothing for the anointing to come upon. But while there's a head over proper unity, then the anointing comes. Now the anointing comes upon the order, but it begins with the head. Is that okay? Once you get into proper order, then you become a candidate for the anointing. The anointing comes down upon the head, it flows down upon the shoulders and on the beard, and then it goes down the body right to the... <coughs> to the extremities of the body. And you will find that, it, and I've taught this and I've counseled many, many times, and when husbands and wives get themselves into right order, and instead of criticizing your perhaps rather weak head, you get under him and say, well, I, you're not perhaps the best head in the world, but I'm going to believe God for you, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get under you and push you up to where you ought to be. He said, you're a fine head, you are, you weak little wimp of a man. And if you talk him down into nothing, you make the situation worse. If you get under him and push him up by faith to where he ought to be, you confess him into who he's supposed to be in God, and the anointing comes upon him for headship, and he starts to be a real head. I tell you, you've got power in the home. Amen? And once that anointing comes, it's amazing how it goes right to the edges of the family. Those rebellious kids suddenly get in order because they feel the power of the order and they feel the power of the anointing. And I've seen that happen again and again. What do we do with our rebellious kids? Well, how are you two getting on together? Oh well. And that's often where the problem is. She's dishonoring him and he's not functioning correctly. Get, get those things sorted out, get into proper unity, the anointing comes, and those same kids who were formerly rebellious get into order, and you find them now growing up in the security of a proper headship and proper government in the family. And it's equally true of the church. You see, the elder's job is not to pull the head down, it's to push him up. Even if he's got his flaws and his faults, all the more reason to pray for him, all the more reason to push him up to where he's supposed to be. Amen? And if you do that, then an anointing begins to flow on the head, comes down upon the, the elders, upon the, upon the shoulders, and goes right down. And all these rebellious church members who were criticizing and finding fault, they find the power of the anointing suddenly comes upon them, and they start to be respectful and honoring to the proper order which there now is in the headship of the church and in the, the government of the church. You see, in the universal church, Jesus Christ is the head, but the apostles are the shoulders. Is that okay? In the local church, the, the lead man, the pastor, the set man, whatever you want to call him, those are the shoulders. They are part of the government, but they're not the head. There always has to be a head. 
And in the family, it's the husband and wife together, but it's the husband that has the headship. And, and if you get yourself in proper order, there's a power that flows in the anointing. Is that okay? And so this anointing flows, and it becomes precious, and it goes right to the extremities of the, gar of the garden. Come to the end of page 2, and we read here that the shoulders, this is really telling you what the shoulders are supposed to do. It speaks of the government being upon the shoulders. The shoulders are to support the head. They are the burden-bearing part of the body to carry the load. They also lift up the head, and they free the head to look and seek direction. I couldn't help but noticing, as I've travelled around the world and lived in various cultures, that where a culture is particularly demon-cursed, you know how people carry the loads? They carry them on their heads. And they walk along with these great loads on their heads, and you can see coolies in India with maybe 50, 60 kilograms on their heads, walking along with these great loads, and they're so, they're so bowed down that it can't, it's got no time to see where it's going. It's just trying to carry this load. And you find the same in Africa, you find the same in China, where it's a demon-cursed society, the load's gone onto the head. And as a result, the head can't turn around and look to see where to take the body. So it usually ends up tripping over something. And many, many heads of churches are burdened with a burden they shouldn't be carrying because it should be on the shoulders. And when it goes onto the shoulders, the head's then free to look around and start to get direction so it can lead the body in the right direction. Amen? So shoulders are there to support, they're there to, to share the burden, and they're there to lift up the head, and they're there to free the head to look and seek direction. And this is what spiritual shoulders are supposed to do. They are part of the government, but they're not the head. They constantly lift up the head and support it. You see, if you're an elder in a church, your first calling with your wife every day is to pray for the guy who leads. That's, that's, that's your first calling is an honor. So every day we're going to pray for him, pray God's blessing upon our leader, praise God's anointing upon our leader. Oh God, make him all that you want him to be. We lift him up to you. Let your anointing flow down all over. And I tell you, as I have learned to do that, even with men I couldn't stand. I'm serious. I've been through all this. I know what it feels like to be under a guy that I could cheerfully kill. And yet, yet knowing that I'm joined to him in the Lord. And, and, and having to battle with all this resentment and all this offense and, and learning from God, pray for him, pray for him, lift him up because if you honor my order, I'll do something about him. And I've seen God take this guy, I won't say where or who, and turn him right round. In 18 months, I saw God transform that man into a totally different man who I could now proudly serve because he was all that I ever wanted him to be. Instead of criticizing him and finding fault, I pushed him up into God with my prayers and by my verbal encouragement whenever I got the opportunity. Amen? Beloved, it really works. I'm telling you the truth. Okay? So, the, the spiritual shoulders are part of the government. They lift up the head. They share the burden. So the head's free to concentrate looking and hearing and leading the body in the right direction. The shoulders do not in any way challenge the head. Hello? Though respectful confrontation or correction may be necessary, they don't fight with the head, they don't tear the head down, nor do they dishonor it. If there's a right honor and appreciation between head and shoulders, then the shoulders are able to turn the head smoothly without pain. The head is able to respond to the suggestion and correction from the shoulders. The shoulders will also do this with proper respect. If a wife stops pulling her husband to pieces and says, I believe in you, and I'm, I'm, I'm believing God for you, and you're going to become a great leader of our family, and you're going to be something in the church, before long he will listen to you. Because you're not against him, you're on his side now. In all the exhortations to wives, in Ephesians chapter 5, it's summarized by this one word, wives, this is the one thing that you must do, you must respect your husband. The one thing a man cannot take is a disrespectful wife. He can not take a lot, but that's the one thing he cannot take. And conversely, the one thing that a man must do to his wife is he must love her. That's how it's all summarized. Husbands, you love your wives, and wives, you respect your husbands, and you're going to sort out anything else that's giving you a problem. And that's the truth. Amen? So you have to honor and not tear down. But, but if there is dislocation between head and shoulders, then plurality of government literally becomes a pain in the neck. <laughs> Amen. In the universal church, Jesus is the Father, head and the shoulders of the apostles and prophets. 
in the family, the husband, head and wife, and so on and so forth. I've said all that. And then I think I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there. The rest of it, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. It's so fully written, but it, we have this question of where does final authority lie outside the church? I deal with all that, but I think it's so fully written that you can read it and absorb it without me really needing to comment anymore. So what I like to do is to stop there and then turn over the rest of the time to try and answer any questions. Is that okay? Are you happy with that? I mean, you can read that rest of it. I think it'll, it'll speak for itself. Amen. Well, obviously there has to be the sort of relationship where they do know the man. Otherwise, you, you, you functionally cannot do it. So I would never um, accept that sort of responsibility until I've been working with the church and knew it. Um, well, obviously you've worked with the set man, and I have my ways and means of, of when I go into a church, of, of using certain questionnaire techniques to find out pretty well what, what the condition is. But I wouldn't presume to do it unless I knew. And then, of course, the other factor is, is, is prayer. I mean, it was with prayer and fasting they appointed elders in the early church. Now, I have had one occasion where I violated that rule because I was asked to go to a church. It was in a pretty critical state. They called me, and it's rather like coming in when the patient's about to die. And the answer was the immediate appointing of elders. And yet I couldn't wait for a year to get to know them. So I had to just call on God and say, God, this is a desperate situation. You're just going to have to supernaturally empower me to know what's right here. And with the pastor who had been um, a very um, controlling one-man show, and my first job was to get him into a little private room and you know, have a little fatherly chat with him, which I did, and, and so that he changed his style. And then I said, now we need elders pretty well right away. And so I just called on God, and God literally told me who to appoint. And that was unusual and exceptional, and I did it. And I took responsibility for it. Someone else nearly had a fit. Said, I said, well, look, I've got to do it because I can see we have to do this. So I've got to you know, do this as an emergency. And, and I'm glad to say that every one of those elders, I'm looking back four years ago, it changed the whole church. It went from chaos to glorious order. And every one of those elders turned out real good. So the Lord knew, even when I didn't know naturally, who was to be appointed. But, but generally speaking, you make sure that you are familiar and know before you would uh, take such a responsibility. Is that okay? Yes. You will want to ask a question, brother. Oh, yes, you a little bit from yesterday. You talked about the Ephesians 4 elder and how they think vision, strategy, and principle, and they don't think people need uh, detail. Yeah. It's more of a, a progression from the from people who need over to the vision. Or is it, is it yeah. Process? Yes. Well, um, I guess, let's say the Ephesians 4 ministry as distinct from the elder, okay? Because the elders do have a concern and their calling is to the people. I mean, I put on my notes yesterday, but I didn't actually read it out, that, that Ephesians 4 ministries, they are, their focus is the work of God in a, in a broader, wider sense. The elders, their focus is the people of God. And deacons, their focus is the task of God. That's, so you've got those three distinct focuses, and God's made them that way. And so even in pretty early stages, an Ephesians 4 man will be thinking about, you know, how do we take the city? How do we reach the lost? How do we, you know, change our society? He's got that sort of broader vision. It doesn't mean he doesn't love people. It doesn't mean he's not concerned about them, but he's not... Is, is, is sort of what's making him tick, what's firing him, is the wider and uh, larger purposes of God. Whereas the elder thinks about, I want to see brother and sister so-and-so grow to maturity. I want their kids to be successful. And so he focuses in on the maturity of the saints. And the focus of the Ephesians 4 ministry is upon the establishing of the work and of the kingdom of God. Is, is that okay? Does that help at all? Yes. But that doesn't mean they don't love people. But it just means they don't give their time to meeting the needs of people because they've got another calling upon their life. Is that all right? Any, any other question? Yes, ma'am. Of 
Could you speak up a bit, dear? What we have? Oh, page three of the Captains of Thousands, yeah. Yeah, well, there are certain people who are released to the body of Christ, and their sort of measure is the bigness of a captain of thousands, but they don't actually oversee large numbers. They're, they're released to be a gift to the body of Christ. That's what I mean by that. They're big, I mean, they might be, uh, say, a powerful healing evangelist. They might be a powerful prophetic ministry. They might be someone like myself, who, although for many years I did build churches, Five years ago, God told me to hand over the churches that I was now fathering, pastoring, to someone else, and then just to be free to be available as a father to men around the United States and around other parts of the world. Now, I couldn't do what I do and have the responsibility of a large local church. I just couldn't do the two. So I'm based in a church in Eagle's Nest in San Antonio, where I'm just loved and received and blessed, and they expect nothing from me except to go. <laughs> which is wonderful. I mean, they are so gracious and good to me. They provide me with office facilities, with a secretary. If I'm around, they, they love me. I preach maybe twice a year in the church. Eileen does a little bit more. But uh, w you've no idea how we feel so part of that wonderful family because they know our calling is out and they're happy to release us and just facilitate the, the calling of God upon our life. So I, I don't have thousands of over whom I'm directly having a, a, you know, a pastoral oversight. But, I, but I, that's the measure of my gift. It's in that category that I've described. So you get people like that. Okay. And, it's a, and it should be seen by the church as a privilege to be able to provide a base and to receive... I mean, 5% of, of, of that kind of gift flowing back into the church can be a great blessing. And you just receive the gift but release it for the bigger thing that God's called it to, to do. Is that Okay. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. If in the case with the, um, the difference between the Ephesians 4 man and the elders, yes. if, if the elder doesn't think people need uh, local details in daily affairs, yeah. um, and he's not an Ephesians 4 person, would, would that indicate that his qualifications are well, um, no, not exactly. Uh, I would say that if he really does think this way, then he could be a deacon given to serve an Ephesians 4 or apostolic ministry team. That's one possible explanation. Or he could be an Ephesians 4 man who's still growing and developing into his measure and into his gift. And even if he is a fully-fledged Ephesians 4 ministry, and he is resident and, and active in the local church, he would still be an elder as well as functioning in his gift. And he could be part of the eldership because he's got a hands-on, involved relationship with the local church. So it could be in any one of those things, really. Does that help at all? Okay. Any other questions? Are you hearing the questions okay, or do I need to repeat them? You are, okay. Did you want to ask yes, that? Alan, the, um, Just raise your voice. The headship aspect of things in the Godhead right now. Yeah. And in the home. Um, how can single mothers uh, without the proper headship in the home uh, extend their faith to the headship of the church to, to draw out that which is missing in the home? Well, of course, that is a non-ideal situation which many people face. And I would say that her first calling is upon God the Father to be a father and, and to posture her kids to find the fatherhood of God. Because it is a tragic fact that children without proper fathering, however much the mother loves them and however much she does, she cannot fully replace that lack. And this is a tragic reality that we have to face. And so... Uh, that sort of one is to, is to, because after all, even a, a natural father, his job is to, as quickly as possible, plug his kids into the fatherhood of God. He, the father has to point them to the father. And a mother can do that. And she can continually posture him and say, well, there is a heavenly father, a real father, and he's going to teach you and show you all about fatherhood. And it's amazing, if you posture them that way, how much that can help. Now, the church can help to some extent. 
And of course, the church to some extent can give that lack um, of fatherhood and give at least give the children, you know, male father roles for the children to learn what fathering is all about. So it means that that that. Uh, Effective families take the kids in, take them on vacation, whatever, you know, take a single mum with her kids along with you, so that, so, so that, and then you can be a sort of proxy father over the whole thing. There's quite a lot of things you can do to help to give those kids a taste of fatherhood, but it really is, you know, a difficult problem to totally and absolutely resolve. And it, you know, and it is, it is a lack which, of course, all we can do is to do our best to make it up, but I don't think we can be entirely successful. Does anybody else want to comment on that? But that's roughly what I can say in a few words. I mean, I mean, fathering is so desperately important. Yes, dear. Well, yes. I mean, let's say it's got to be handled with care. Because there, are, I mean, I've I've seen too many situations over my thirty years where single parent mothers, in all their vulnerability, have been looking for a male father input to them and to their kids, and it started off right but ended up wrong. So it needs to be handled with care, and and uh, you know, well-meaning men have gone round to help fix the plumbing or to fix the car, or just to be a father to the kids, and before long. Things start happening emotionally that shouldn't happen. So you've just got to be, got to be careful of that thing. But, uh, I mean, certainly, insofar as it's possible, but never to the full degree, um, the, the, the father figures in the church have got to do their best to give fatherhood to, to the kids. And they've got to be a little more careful how they provide, you know, a, a husband needs into, I mean, we, we always had everybody in home groups, you see, so, that, so in a home group, they they did what they could for that in a practical way, like if there was a, the car wouldn't start, or there was plumbing needed fixing, there, or the, 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 the lawn need mowing, that home group would, would provide those things which the husband would have provided if he was at home, and that's the best that we could do, but there was, it always was done in a way where it didn't get intimate, because you can't allow it to get intimate. Is that okay? And that's the best. That's the best you can do under the circumstances. But, but, uh, uh, and so she can't have a literal head. And I've heard his teaching. Well, the elders become your head. I don't agree with that. Christ is your head, and and there isn't any other head that a woman has except her husband. And I don't agree with that. Although there can be some filling of the father gap, providing it's handled with wisdom and with care. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. On that note, um, I had a question yesterday. So you answered it to a certain extent when you discussed um, uh, single people. Um, yeah. Uh, first elders and deacons and so on. So when it comes to uh, somebody having an ambition to become an elder and they're single, single mother, that, yeah. that's not open. Is it? No. Um, let me just say a bit about, about elders because, you see, I believe women fully functioning in the body in terms of preaching, gift and everything, uh, in leadership, but the one thing that they can't do is to have the final father headship. Now, tragically, occasionally, that even happens and, and God gives grace because it was never his, he gives grace to a single parent mum, but that's not his ideal plan. And, and I do know, like a situation that I was involved with, um, there was this, this couple together you know, and of course, in their oneness, they were like they were they were the pastors of the church. I mean, she was fully involved. She was a mother. He was a father to this church. It grew to about three hundred. Then the man ran off with another woman, left her with three natural children and almost three hundred spiritual children. This woman just found grace in God, rose to the occasion. She mothered her natural kids, and she also mothered the family. And the church grew under her leadership until it was about eight or nine hundred, and by this time her, her youngest son, had he was about thirty-five now, and he just recently stepped into the pastor role, and she was very relieved to step back and let him have the fatherhood of the church. Now, that God was with her every inch of the way, but it doesn't mean that it's his pattern. 
doesn't mean it's his idea way of doing things. And so I can see women on an eldership, because actually the Greek word for elder, presbyteros, is used for women three times in the New Testament. Presbytes is the female form, but it's translated in our English Bibles, older woman. It does not translate as elderess, but it's the same Greek word. And, and so I can see women, and you see, the church needs fathers, and it needs an overall father, but it needs other men functioning as fathers under the overall fatherhood. It also needs mothers. A church without mothers is a very um, bereft church. And so I can see mature older women functioning as mothers in the church. And I, I have them sitting on the eldership. But remember what I said to you yesterday about the pecking order. You see, they cannot be fathers because a woman cannot be a father. She can be everything else except a father. So, so I have them because they, they so enrich and enhance the eldership by their, their older mature woman perspective. And, we're, and I'm so grateful for what they contribute. But, but that doesn't mean they can become the same as men and have fatherhood because women can't be fathers. It just, they just, just, that isn't, you know, God made them male and female. He made them separate and distinct. And so that's the only thing that I would, you know, have a slight reservation about. So I would have no problem with women being on an eldership, provided they don't try and become fathers to the body. And they can function as mothers, and, but then you need the overall fatherhood to give it completeness, and you need fathers as well. Is that okay? That's how I see it. But I haven't got a lot of scripture to go on, I might add. This is what I've just learned over the, over the decades of experience. There's just little scriptural hints, that's all. Is any, everybody happy with that? Yes, ma'am. To the family. Boy, that's a tough one. Well, you mean he's gone away and left the family? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd agree. And that's so, I don't think you can give general rules. It all depends on who he is and how he behaves towards the children. If he's a jerk and going to mess the kids up, then, then, <laughs> then you, you keep him away from them. But, uh, um, but then if he's not a jerk, why isn't he there fathering the kids? So, so. <laughs> but, but uh, and if he's an unbeliever that's gone away and, and will not bring godly influence, I mean, obviously you're going to have to fulfill the law, whatever the law has put con but constraints. But I mean, we, we have some very painful situations in our church in Texas where these kids are having to go and see a father that's corrupting them and the, the mother's in absolute agony every time she goes. And we're just praying and fighting for, for that relationship because he, sometimes he's doing it out of spite. And, and there's some very vicious uh, uh, relationships and we're praying for God to, to terminate the relationships. And, and so if I frankly feel, well, the less he sees of them, while he's in this mood or frame of mind, the better for the kids. They're, they're better off without that. Although, of course, they're going to suffer scars and injuries for the lack of a real father. But that kind of fathering is probably more damaging than it's, than it's beneficial. And so, so you're just fraught with all kinds of agonizing situations. And, you know, I, my wife and I, we weep together. We, you know, we pray. We, we're fighting. But you, you feel... You know, dear God, just, just move in. And we've seen God give some wonderful answers because he is so concerned for the fatherless. And I should add, by the way, in Scripture, that the word which is translated widow, in literal Greek, it simply means bereft of a spouse. I mean, that's all it means. So, in other words, I regard single parent mothers, or fathers for that matter, as, 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 as qualifying for all that the Bible says we're to do for widows. And I think that's a very important thing to see. Amen? <coughs> bereft of a spouse is what it really means. So if she's bereft of a spouse, then the church does all it can to help to fill that void, financially and in every other way. But, but you've got to be careful that a man trying to help doesn't cross the line of, of intimacy because that, that will mess everything up. Amen? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Um, 
said none of them are inferior, but um, yeah. how is the father the head? How is he the head? Because headship is not a matter of superiority, it's a matter of order. And it's the same with the, with the husband and the wife. The, the head, uh, that man is not head for, out of superiority, but, but they are equally precious and equally valuable, but God has just set order in the family. And, and so it says that Jesus, for example, oh, he was equal with God, but he didn't snatch at him, but he humbled himself. And so we have to make the distinction between uh, value and worth and order. And, and a deacon is just as valuable as someone who's called to be an apostle. It's just a difference of order, that's all. And we've got to get those two things very clear in our mind. A man doesn't have headship because he's superior, but because God's given headship to the family, to the man. But he's... He, he has to honor her, that's what it says in Scripture. And it says in, just before it introduces the husband and wife relationship in Ephesians 5, 22, and tells husbands what they're to do and wives what they're to do, in verse 21, he, he commands that there has to be mutual submission one to another. So I submit to my wife, although I've got the headship. Does that make sense to you? I have a submissive attitude that she can teach me. She's, she's precious. She's, uh, she's, in many ways... You know, I, I can so honor and, and admire her and yet still exercise a God-given headship over our joint relationship. And that's not a contradiction of terms. And she's absolutely as precious in the sight of God and, and in every other way as I am. Is that okay? Okay. Any other questions? That was one more from you, sir. Okay. Well, it depends on his attitude. I mean, it all depends on the motive for coming. I mean, I think we mentioned this yesterday, that, that if people come to seek their own, then they're going to be a disaster, however gifted they are. And, and so it has to be to serve, and it has to be for the sake of the people that we, that we function. And if someone comes from another setting, I would say that he has to leave right. If he hasn't left right, then I'm, I'm immediately suspicious and not immediately receiving as to why he's come here. So I would say, well, I need to call the other pastor and find out why you left. If he releases you with blessing and with joy, then we'll now ask you to come to this church and we're not going to give you any place because we have to find out who you are and you've got to earn your right to lead amongst these people. And, and if you didn't leave right, then we would respectfully re suggest you go back and put things right with the other place before you come here. And if we did that, we would stop a lot of this, you know, uh, unproductive church jumping that goes on. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, I, I think we've just about come to, I think we have finished.